you have your Bibles this evening, let's go to the book of Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. And today we'll read verses 1 through 6. It says this, uh, beginning of verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. The message this evening is on the subject of deliverance from the law. Deliverance from the law. Now we spent some time in Romans chapter 6 in which it was answered that chief objection that folks might have against the doctrine of justification by faith without works. And in doing so, uh, we found that, that uh, we as Paul wrote under the divine inspiration, we find that even though believers are dead to sin, we are exposed to temptations. We begin to see that. And that is what, we be, what we're reading on is a continuation of that thought into this chapter. As as the Apostle Paul lays out his argument for justification by faith and lays out the argument of the truth that he is presenting, he begins in what we know as chapter 7 here, and he begins to, uh, to, to, to relate his own experiences since he became dead to the law and was united to Christ. And of course... As we continue on in chapter 7, we're going to read and study, and to many of us this is very familiar ground, but, um, but he's going to lay out that inward struggle that he had with sin and that we all can relate to, at least those of us who have been born again. So, let's start out here with verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Now some folks kind of get all caught up in this and begin to really see things that I don't believe are really there. Uh, remember the church there at Rome was composed of Jews as well as Gentiles. And so some commentators and indeed some preachers, as they began to look at this, they said, well, chapter 7, he's talking to the Jews. I don't believe that's the case. Uh, there are times when he speaks to the Jews or when he writes to the Jews uh, differently than the Gentiles, and that is very, very clear. But when he uses the word brethren, he's using it the way that we're familiar with, in the Christian sense. Uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ are of all nationalities, uh, all 
of the people groups, uh, certainly Jews as well as Gentiles. And uh, he begins this epistle in that same way, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 13. Romans chapter 1 and verse 13. He says, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. So we can read, uh, and, and it doesn't take much English to really begin to break this verse down to know that Paul is not simply telling the Jews he wanted to come and see them. In fact, he's talking to the whole church, and he tells them that he... Uh, in, in the latter part of it, he even mentions something about other Gentiles. So, not that it was the Jews separated from the Gentiles, but rather that this was the people. These were the people of God. These were. This was another church, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, and 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 and, and when, so, whenever he talks about brethren, he's using it in the Christian sense, the way that we understand it. Um, literally no different uh, if he were to if the Apostle Paul was to be among us and uh, uh, provided there's no issue with languages uh, he would have no problem understanding our use of the word uh, he would not have any problem with us using the word brethren certainly he would not have any problem figuring out uh, what that means on the door back there. Uh, it's a common word that all God's people have known and used from even the very first. One of these days, uh, one of these days we'll all be in heaven and we'll certainly get to see many of the brethren that uh, we uh, never met, some that we have before, but uh, I'm telling you something special. There's a kindred there. Uh, kindred spirit, the, we're family, and um, it's it's something that's easy to easy to figure out here in the in this world, and it's it'll be very very easy to figure out obviously in heaven, and in the scriptures we find that uh, he uses that word the way he does. Now, even though it's uh, it's an endearing term. It's, uh, it's the Christian manner of using it. It's not in the national way of using it. He does use it in a forceful way. Notice in Romans chapter 7. Know ye not, brethren. So Paul is very, very direct, very blunt with those he writes to. Uh, literally, if we were to bring this into our own common language that we use on the streets, uh, you might he might he might have said, "Are you ignorant, brother? Uh, have you have you not known? Do you not understand? Right? Um, do you not know at this point that you are freed?" from the subjection to the law as a source and rule of justification, or are you ignorant of these things? This is what he's talking about here in this passage. I can't help but imagine, as Paul writes, and, and, and looking at this, he writes this way in other places too. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, in verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Uh, and then again in Romans chapter 6 and verse 16. Uh, 
Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. In each of these instances, Paul is writing this way, very, very directly, very bluntly, and he's writing about something that his readers should already know about the truth. I can't help but think that uh, Paul probably preached this way as well. I, I would imagine that uh, his writing style um, comes across also in his speech, as is often the case, and uh, I would imagine he preached in such a manner also. Very direct, very blunt, preaching with as one that had authority. Certainly, we need those kind of preachers, those kind of directness. Uh, we live in a world where folks want things sugar-coated, but uh, the reality of it is we're dealing with a very, very important uh, book, uh, the most important book that you'll ever find, and we're dealing with the most important message that you'll ever hear. And so we need more directness. Well, he says there in, 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 in chapter 7, <coughs> you notice there in verse 1, there's a parenthetical statement. For I speak to them that know the law. Again, like I said, I don't believe he's just speaking to the Jews, but every saint within the church there knew the law of God. This is a subject, the law of God is a subject that is important to Jews as well as Gentiles. Now, the law of God can be divided up in many different ways and sometimes we do that just for study purposes. But he's not talking about for instance, the ceremonial laws. I believe he's talking about those moral laws which cover all of Adam's race. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll look at that a little bit more here in a moment. But being that this is in a parenthetical phrase, and the way that it's put here, I get the feeling that as they were acquainted with the law, so they must be convinced also of the truth that he was setting forth. These are things that uh, they should have already known, that they should have been convinced of already. And so to present this truth, he gives an illustration. An illustration that Jew as well as Gentile would understand. An illustration that you and I understand, even though we're separated by uh, many, many years and a whole different culture. That is the illustration using the universal law of marriage. <coughs> In Romans chapter 7, verse 1, 2, and 3, he says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. This is what he's talking about here. It's the universal law of marriage. And he's using this as an example. It's a law that was instituted by Almighty God way back yonder in the Garden of Eden. <coughs> Excuse me. And it is a law that has never changed, nor will it ever change. In the book of Genesis chapter 2, Go over there with me. We'll go back to the beginning here. Genesis chapter 2, and verses 24, 25. We find the first marriage. And it says, 
Therefore shall a, shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. This is the first, this, this is where marriage comes from. And uh, uh, in Matthew chapter 19, in Matthew 19, verses 4, 5, and 6, Beginning of verse, yeah, beginning of verse three. <clears throat> the Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause. <coughs> For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. ceremony somewhere, but that had its beginning with God. And and, 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 and and he's the one who originated marriage between a man and a woman. Unfortunately, so many in this world have not taken their vows seriously, don't take marriage seriously. And so we find divorce and things running rampant in our day and age. Uh, but that doesn't change the universal law of marriage. In fact, uh, if you continue reading there uh, in verses 8 and 9, He saith unto them, Because of the hardness of your hearts, uh, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, shall, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. Whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. So Jesus narrowed it down. They were even having divorce for whatever reason back in Jesus' day, and he said, no, wait a minute. Let's, let's bring this thing back a little bit. And... Paul, as he writes, he has taken this in its pure form and using it as an illustration. Now, if you notice and if you read it very carefully there in Romans chapter 7, we'll go right there. In the first verse, as he's setting this up, it was the husband that died. Notice the latter part of it. The law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. But then in the rest of this, 2 and 3, we find that it's the... It, it, we, we, we find that, that he carries that on. And then in verse 4, he says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So, so by the time you get to verse 4, uh, it's the wife. But no matter which way that you look at this, 
the law is the same. Whether it's the wife who dies or the husband, the union is dissolved, not before, but only after. Yeah, I know there are scriptural reasons for divorce and there are scriptural reasons for remarriage, but in its pure form, this is the law. something choked me up. And he says here in verse 4, Ye are, ye also are become dead to the law. Wherefore, my brethren, ye are, ye also are become dead to the law. Again, he is talking about the moral law of God. It's this law that was given to the Jews, but it's also the law that was written on the hearts of the Gentiles. Remember in Romans chapter 2, verses 14 through 17, we read about that. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, those having not the law are law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, behold thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. So whether you're Jew or Gentile, this applies. And uh, Paul is definitely speaking of what we would know as the moral laws of God. The things like we would know as the Ten Commandments. The things that even the most ignorant of tribes uh, know to be true. Uh, you realize that you go into tribal people that have never read the Bible or uh, never... I uh, had a preacher among them. They will have laws against uh, murder, laws against uh, the, the laws against um, against thievery, things like that. Why? Because we're made in the image of God, and they have the law of God written on their hearts. The Gentiles never knew the ceremonial laws. The the sacrifices and those things that we read about in the Old Testament. They were ignorant of those things. And so he's not talking about that because they were not never married to that sort of thing. So what's he mean by being dead to the law? To be dead to the law is to be free from the power of it. The demands of the law have been satisfied and the curse has been endured. For, the, for those of us who are believers, the law has ceased to have its claim on our obedience. It still remains our rule of duty, but it's not what it used to be to us. Remember, the law says, do this and live. The law says, if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. The law says, Cursed is everyone that continueth not. And all things are written in the book of the law to do them. There's no life to be found in the law. There's only condemnation. The law was mankind's first marriage. Remember, when they're in the Garden of Eden, They had a law, but it was broken. Funny. After just a short time, it was broken. And so the law has become a curse. And its curse must be executed upon all the human race, every descendant of Adam, every man, woman, and child, all who remain under it, or 
in Christ who was made under the law and who is representative of all believers who are united under Him and born of God. As the relation of a wife and her husband is dissolved by death, so are we who are born again. We've been released from our relation to the law through the death of Christ with whom we died. For He died to sin. Remember in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse number 10. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are partakers of the benefits of heaven because of Jesus Christ and his death. We are no longer married to the law in the sense that it has dominion over us. And we, it no longer has the power that it did. We're married to another. Interesting that, you know, Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 7 rather, In verse 4, he says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. A lot of commentators miss this, but I believe that Paul is speaking particularly and especially to a church. Actually, I know he is. I don't have to believe it. I can say of, a, of a surety that he is. He's writing to the church at Rome. Now, there's something special about that because, well, the Lord bride is going to be taken from among his true churches. And indeed, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter number, in, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He said this to the church at Corinth. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, he says, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. The Lord has His bride, and, 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 I, and I believe it's a Baptist bride, and, and, and we find that written very clearly in 2 Corinthians, and we find it very much hinted at here in Romans chapter 7. As He tells them there in verse 4, Ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Make no mistake about it. All of God's people, uh, and God does have a people, uh, they all will be saved, but I believe that there is a special place for the Lord and His bride. And we find that to, to be true through the Scriptures. There will be a wedding someday. And there will be uh, those who are in the bride. And then there will be those who are guests at the wedding. We will not take a lot of time of looking at that. But we do want to notice that, that this is very true. I believe that... Uh, it is the responsibility of all of God's people to serve the Lord in and through His church. Certainly, 
we find a lot of truth that is found here. And as we look at this, he says, in this the latter part of verse 4, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. That we should bring forth fruit unto God. Is not this one of the great ends of marriage to the people of this world? Uh, in John chapter 14, John chapter 14, I'm sorry, John chapter 15, verses 4 through 8. Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the fruit, I am the vine, rather. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is... He is cast forth as a branch and is withered. Men gather them and cast them in the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. God has ordained that we be married to Christ that we bring forth fruit. And that's how that the Father is glorified. Our life down here is not intended for us just to accumulate all the wealth we can grab and then be done with it. But our life down here is to be spent bearing forth fruit that we may glorify our Father which is in heaven. God has ordained that marriage bring forth good fruit. And this is true, and this can be seen even going back into the Old Testament. In Malachi chapter 2, Malachi chapter 2, and verse 15. And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. Now of course we can take this uh, and, and use it for the physical marriage. And, it, and indeed it fits, but let us consider spiritually as well. And mark well, there is no good work that can be considered fruit unto God before there is a union with Christ. In Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 7, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And then over in the book of Isaiah, chapter 64. Isaiah chapter 64. Verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. So the lost man, uh, even though he might try to do some good things, he's not doing them in a way that's pleasing to God. And God says that even his 
righteousnesses are as filthy rags. They, they have a stench about them. There's nothing good about them. And then even after we're saved, we are commanded to, re well, we were commanded to be baptized. We looked at that before recently. Um, and in the book of Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 21. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. So God has uh, given his church, provided for it. Uh, we've been told that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is for the glory of God. And so the works that we do, the things that we do as saved individuals, we're doing them to bring forth fruit so that our Father may be glorified. Even our church attendance, it is for the glory of God. I saw, I saw something on Facebook. The guy said, hey, uh, I really didn't like the worship service. I really wasn't uh, that great of a worship service. And uh, the preacher said, well, that's okay. We weren't worshiping you. Uh, too many people come to church expecting that they'll get something out of it. But what is it that you're putting in for the Lord? I mean, even, even the time that we spend in preparation for the assembling of ourselves together is important. Uh, that we do it for the glory of God. Uh, not haphazardly or, 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 or anything like that, but certainly uh, for God's glory. And once we have joined the church... Let us serve Him uh, and bear fruit, not that we make a name for ourselves out of such things, but that we do it for God's glory. I was watching a documentary about Charles Spurgeon. And you know, the, the greatness of Charles Spurgeon and the great numbers that, that uh, came and heard him preach. And the guy who, was, who did this documentary he said, you know, it's amazing that there's not the first church of Spurgeon and the second church of Spurgeon and, 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 and this great Spurgeon denomination. But I tell you why there's not. Because Spurgeon was doing things for the glory of God. You may not always agree with everything he did, but I'm telling you, we're not here to make a name for ourselves. We are here to serve the Lord, to bear fruit, unto God. There is this fruit and this marriage. And so then we go back to Romans chapter 7. In verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. It's a good idea sometimes to remember what we were before. When we were in the flesh, when we were in our sins, when we were in our natural state. It doesn't matter your story, your background, your history. We were all there. The motions of sins. Your sin may have been different than my sin, but we were all sinners. We were doing those things that were forbidden by the law. So that's what sin is, the transgression of the law, the breaking of God's law. We were lawbreakers. Those were the things that we loved the most, though, weren't they? Oh, how we enjoyed our sins. But how horrible it is to think that the fruit of such living, the fruit of living in sin, the motions of sins, did work in our members, did work in our lives, 
in a way that would bring forth fruit unto death. That's not much fruit, is it? That's not a good fruit. In Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, beginning at verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruit ye shall know them. You see, what Paul is writing about there, about in the, in the flesh, bringing forth fruit unto death, very different than the fruit of the believer. And there's a difference. Just like you can go out into your garden, into your orchard, and be able to tell the difference between the peach tree and the apple tree, or even if there's a group of apple trees, you can tell which one is the good tree and which one's the bad just based upon the fruit that that tree produces. So we, we see this. We're warned that the life in sin produces bad fruit. But we're told that the fruit of the believer is going to give God great glory and honor and well pleasing to him remember what uh, remember what he said there in Romans chapter 6 verse 23 for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord the, end, the ending the result your long, hard day's work, this is what you get paid in, is death. Death. Verse 5 there of our text, When we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. You see, it was, it was, it, 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 it was a great work that we did but the end result is death. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Meaning, beloved, that there is nothing that we can do to inherit eternal life. That this is a gift from Almighty God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So as we begin to close this out, I'd like for us to go to Romans chapter 7 and verse 6 there. Knowing where we came from, he says, But now, but now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Oh, now we're delivered from the law. The law only brought death. Why? Because the law condemns sinners, and that's what we were. There's no way that anybody could keep the law of God perfectly to satisfy its demands. But now we've been delivered from the law. Well, what happened? How is it that this is possible? Was it something that we did? No, we couldn't. But in Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, beginning at verse 10, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. 
And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Every one of God's people has been delivered from the curse of the law. We've been delivered because Christ fulfilled the law. He suffered its penalty. And now we are free from its demands. We find, as, he, as, as Paul laid it out here under inspiration of the Spirit in Galatians, that the law... The law had some pretty big demands, didn't it? Cursed, verse 10 says, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. You know what that means? One little mess up, one little, one little thing that you did wrong, you're cursed. In, in this, we find it says, The man that doeth them shall live in them. The law had demands. You've got to do these things and you'll live. But we fail before we even start. Thank God Christ came. The only one who could come and keep the law of God perfectly. That he would take our sins upon himself and die, suffering the penalty for us. Now the law says what it wants, what it what it does. But Christ took our place satisfied its demands and indeed the law in Romans chapter 7 and verse 6 he says we're delivered from the law being made that being dead wherein we were held that we should serve in newness of spirit not in the oldness of the letter The effect of being delivered from the law is this, that we should serve in newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. Meaning we serve not because we suppose that we'll inherit favor from God. Not because we're trying to work our way to get somewhere, but because of a grateful obedience to our deliverer, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. In John chapter 14 and verse 15, we'll close with this. John 14 and verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. We, we serve out of love, not out of fear or dread. It's not a taskmaster like it was, you see. We indeed have been delivered from the law. Thank God for His grace. And thank God for the truth that's found there in Romans chapter 7. Brother Ray, would you please pray? <coughs> 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 <coughs>